Hey, welcome to the Bible and today's culture. So we've been looking at various domains and how God looks at them. We've looked at business and economics, and we found that his principal uh, objective was to reduce poverty, give people a second chance at economic success. Uh, we're in the hot science and health, and we're seeing that God wants to give us health and not require miracles. Uh, and so part of our job as co-managers of creation is to think like him and to help people have second chances of poverty, have second chances at health. So we are into science and health, and uh, here we go. Okay, since we're dealing with health, I'd like to take a view of the highlights of history of Christian hospitals. But actually, we're going to start with a couple of other cultures before we get into that. So the Hindus. So karma discourages caring for anyone's sufferings. So if you're having problems in your life, you in your reincarnation, in your past life, didn't live well. And so you're paying for it now. And if you don't suffer for it now, you're going to suffer later on. So you have to go through these sufferings to pay for it. Uh, the Greek and the Roman societies, sickness signified human weakness. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, wrote, We drown children who at birth are weak and abnormal. So this is a survival of the fittest. This is their view. And so you don't care for somebody. They just didn't uh, come out right, and you get rid of them. The Romans often fled during the pandemics, leaving the sick to die unattended. Again, survival of the fittest. If they got problems, that's okay. I got to get out of here and save my own life. This contrasts to Moses, who taught guidelines for healthy living and had a promise from God that said, I am the Lord who heals you. What a different attitude towards health. Jesus taught about the Good Samaritan who inspired us to care for others and have compassion. Uh, Jesus listed the works of mercy in Matthew 25. He said, this is what we are living for, to do these things. Caring for the sick, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, visiting the prisoners. This carried on into the early part of the Christian church. Dionysus, a Christian bishop of the third century, described how Christians visited the sick without thought of their own peril. So while the Romans were running away in epidemics from the people who were sick, the Christians were running to them to help them. Something really special happened in 325 AD. It was the Nicene Ecumenical Council. What had happened is Constantine was the new emperor of Rome, and he had declared that Christianity was the preferred religion. And then he asked all the Christian leaders to come to this council. This is the first time they'd ever been public about it because they'd been arrested for being Christians before. It was an unpreferred religion. And so then he asked all the leaders to come together uh, and it was the first public gathering of Christian leaders. Two important things happen that relate to what we're talking about in this class. One, they institutionalized caring for Roman soldiers and the sick. So the Roman soldiers had been arresting them. They now said they're going to be a focus of who we care for, as well as the sick. And each delegate at the council agreed to set up a hospital in each cathedral city on their return home. So this was the, one of the first public things that Christianity did, was provide hospitals and care for people. So Bishop Landry, in 651 AD, started Hotel Du, or meaning the Hostel of God, in Paris. It still exists and is the oldest operating hospital in the world. Hospitals then begin to be named after St. Luke, St. Jude, uh, Methodist Hospital, the Presbyterian Hospital, and the many Catholic hospitals that were named after their saints. 
The Sacra Infirmia was established in 1574. It's an interesting history. It was built by the Knights of St. John on Malta to care for Christians and Muslims and others. It had 914 beds. But the Knights of Columbus had been part of the Last Crusade. They were fighting the Muslims. When that was over, they went back to Malta and built this amazing hospital. And they said it's for everybody. It's for Christian Muslims and others. A hundred years later, they founded the School of Anatomy and Surgery. They said, we've got to figure out how God put our bodies together so that we can help him in bringing health to people. Florence Nightingale, in 1860, went to the battle in Crimea, part of Ukraine. It's happening again today. And she was the founder of nursing. So she was a British Christian who traveled to Crimea to nurse the wounded soldiers. Back in London, she founded a school of nursing, St. Thomas Hospital, again, named after one of the disciples, because we're helping God with bringing health to people. Let me introduce you to Henri Dunant, who in 1864 was a businessman. Let me just pause. You've seen a number of people making significant contributions, and they aren't religious people, uh, like Florence Nightingale. And, and Henri Dumont was a Swiss Christian businessman. The Reformation has happened. The business community is coming in life and making things happen. So as a businessman, he was traveling back to Switzerland, and he passed uh, an area where a war had just taken place. And there were people laying on the ground still alive, and there was nobody taking care of them. This motivated him to start the Red Cross to care for wounded soldiers on both sides of the battlefield. Um, later on, he established the Geneva Convention of the Rules of War, which we still follow today. After that, he founded the YMCA. Um, and he invented the song, Why Am... No, no, no he didn't do that. That was later. Uh, he awarded the first Nobel Prize for peace that was ever given out for the efforts uh, that he accomplished. So my question is, why aren't hospitals today more like they were back then? We've had a lot of scientific adva advantage, but the church and the Christian community has given up the hospitals. Well, it happened in the 1800s when evangelism became the dominant theme of churches. There were evangelists going all around our country, holding tent meetings, asking people to come forward on the sawdust trail and give their lives to Christ. But there was no follow-up on that that said, now that you know Christ, you, you can change the kingdom of God. You can create the kingdom of God, something more like heaven on earth. Um, but that wasn't happening because you know, Christ was coming back in 20 years. It didn't matter that these people were prepared to do something in their 40s or 50s. They were going to be around. The world was going to be raptured. We were going to be gone. And so we didn't waste time. We Not winning people to Christ, we didn't waste time on hospitals anymore. We gave up our educational institutions, more and more colleges were built with no background in faith. Public education became more and more secular. Um, caring for the poor was emphasized less. Many times we had uh, evangelism uh, centers in the major cities for the homeless, for the lost, and we were taking them to Christ. It's only been in the last few years that we said, well, we need to take them to the next level and provide them with re-entry points into society. But way back in the 1800s, that was missed. And that's a reason that our influence in Hollywood would actually came to us early on and asked that the Christian community would take a role in helping movies fit uh, in, more into our lifestyle. And the pastor said, no, we don't, we don't want to get involved in Hollywood. That's not very uh, sacred. 
And we lost our influence in Hollywood, we lost our influence in the hospitals, we lost our influence in education, we lost our influence in the poor. Well, let's get into some of the health issues that the Bible talks about. And here's another health issue. And I asked you last week to think about this question. What biblical command was recently discovered to reduce the spread of sexually transmitted diseases? Okay, so if you're in a group, maybe pause the video right now and everybody give their answer of what you thought was the answer to this question, okay? So uh, pause the video because I'm going to the next slide and it gives you the answer. The answer is circumcision. I wonder how many of you got that right. Here's one of the first things the Bible says through Moses about circumcision. Every male child must be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but also to servants born in your household and foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. Well, this wasn't just for the Jews. The non-Jews that were around were also circumcised. Um, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. So for 1,500 years, they'd been following this commandment. But the question is, why should you be circumcised on the eighth day? Well, because when you are born, your body clotting mechanism operates at 85% of its normal efficiency. And then it begins to go up. And on the eighth day, it's at 110% clotting efficiency. So it's over clotting. It's the best day in your life to have surgery. And then it soon drops down to your normal 100% clotting process for the rest of your life. So God is saying, the eighth day is the best day to have surgery. We don't do that today. We give surgery the same day as the birth or the next day because we give them shots of vitamin K and they clot faster with the, with the shot of vitamin K. We don't have to wait till the eighth day. So... This is what a baby looks like before circumcision, okay? Nice, peaceful life. The next slide shows you what it looks like after you've been circumcised. So, uh, the point here is that we're doing what God wants us to do, all right? So, in 1500 BC, BC, 1400 BC, Moses said, do it on the eighth day because God knew that was the best day to do it. And, and the idea was the baby wouldn't bleed to death on the eighth day. So God's principle was, don't bleed to death during a surgery. Well, what we do today is we give them a shot of vitamin K, and we do it real soon. They don't have to come back to the hospital. The question is, are we doing what God wants us to do? Should we do it on the eighth day because he said that? Or are we following God's principles by doing it with vitamin K? But why be circumcised in the first place? Why are we going through all this? Well, many of you might have watched or listened to Dean Adell. He had the second largest audience of a talk show host in the 1980s and 90s and up to 2010. He was an American physician, but he went on air and he answered people's questions. For In the San Francisco area, it was on during uh, lunchtime, and so I often listened to it. And a question was often posed to him by a pregnant mother. He, he let it come through every six or nine months and he'd give his answer. And his question was, I'm going to have a baby. Is it important that I get him circumcised? And his answer is, it didn't make any difference. It, it's a religious ritual. If you feel it's important in your family and it's a custom, go ahead and do it. If you don't, don't do it. It doesn't make any difference. So 
But in 2000, and, and he was right. I mean, he was so popular. He knew his stuff. But in 2009, a different answer came about. There was new evidence about the value of circumcision. At this time in 2009, AIDS was ravaging Africa. And here it says, the French and South African AIDS researchers have called an early halt to a study of adult male circumcision to reduce HIV infection after initial results reportedly showed that men who had the procedure dramatically lowered their risk of contracting the virus. So they had a control group uh, who were not circumcised and they had a study group of men who were circumcised. And they found out that the circumcised men didn't contract, contact nearly as much HIV. And they said, we're going to stop this. It is so accurate. It's so proven. We're going to stop this research and tell the control group that they need to get circumcised to avoid getting AIDS. So the story further went on. The study's preliminary results disclosed Tuesday by the Wall Street Journal showed that circumcision reduced the risk of contracting HIV by 70%, a level of protection far better than the 30% risk reduction set up as a target for an AIDS vaccine. So the next slide shows you the results of a seminar that was held in San Francisco. So I noticed in the newspapers while studying this that the World Health Organization was holding a health conference and there was going to be a breakout group that people could attend to talk about circumcision and HIV. So this was the report that the breakout group gave to the World Health Organization. They said, While we admit that circumcision reduces the spread of AIDS by over 65%, we cannot require that people avoid AIDS by becoming Jewish. We've been talking in this class about sacred, secular split thinking, like God cares about certain things that are sacred to him, and the rest of the world just doesn't, the, the, those things don't matter. And these people who were generally not believers had the same split thinking. They couldn't see that something could be a health activity as well as a religious activity. They had to be one or the other, they had this split thinking. But this didn't really surprise me because I'd just been at a pastor's conference and I was teaching this class there. And when we got to this subject, they said, no, circumcision is a covenant with God. It has nothing to do with our health. And I said, well, couldn't it be both? Nope, it's just a covenant. And they had the same split thinking, but on the other side of the fence. In Africa, they set up billboards like this to convince men to get circumcised so that, to prevent the spread of HIV. Well, it, it didn't work. The men said, um, no, I'm not interested in having that operation. So they changed their marketing and they marketed to the women. And they said, if you want, don't want to get HIV and pass it on to your child, if you give birth to somebody, don't have sex with someone who is uncircumcised. So the girls began to turn down the boys. All of a sudden the lines got long at the clinics. I'll get circumcised. I guess that tells us who controls male-female relationships, right? All right. But what does this tell us about our, God's character and his understanding and what he's doing for us? He is setting up a very important process to keep us healthy and not to spread disease. Here's how one of the first instances of how we see this at work. And it happens in Joshua chapter 5. And it's God's revealing his purpose for the whole circumcision um, instruction, commandment. And it says, now this is why he, God, did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, 
died in the desert uh, after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised. As they left Egypt, they were all circumcised. But all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not been circumcised. I don't know why, but it would be interesting to figure that out. The Israelites had moved about the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died. So, as they crossed Jordan River and they got into the Promised Land, one of the very first things that happened was this. So, he, God, raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way in the desert. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. So, why be circumcised in the first place? To avoid sexually transmitted diseases like HIV. And they were moving into a culture that was extremely sexually active. One of the gods they worshipped was Astra. And Astra was the god, goddess of fertility. And all through the Promised Land were Asherah poles. They were like barber poles. Uh, or there were places under oak trees where they worshipped Astra. And at both these places, there were temple prostitutes. And the priests were inviting you to come in and have sex with the temple prostitutes. They were the prostitutes of fertility. And this would ensure that your crops would be fertile, or your wife would have birth uh, to children. And, uh, of course, you had to pay a price for the, t for the prostitute, kept the priests alive. And you can imagine all the sexually transmitted diseases were there, and now you can imagine why God said, I don't want you in the promised land more than a couple of days before you all get circumcised. Well, this was kind of confusing to Moses. At the same time, he said, now, let me get this straight. Uh, the Arabs get the oil, and we get to cut off the ends of our what? It didn't seem like a good idea. He didn't realize how valuable it was. So this is an archaeological relic dug up uh, in Israel, and it's representing Astra. And uh, this was saying, you know, come to our prostitutes, and we'll make you fertile and your field's fertile, and whatever else you need to have fertile. Uh, this is a modern depiction of an astra pole, and basically it's in an orchard, and they carved this astra uh, character into a tree trunk, hoping to bring fertility uh, to their orchard. Okay, here's some interesting discussions for you to look at. Take a look at them, talk about them. When you're done doing that, be sure to look at this video of Gary Starkweather. He's the inventor of the laser printer. Great story uh, about how he invented the laser printer uh, for Microsoft. And next week, we're going to be talking about who do you trust to be your diet uh, advisor? Uh, do you trust uh, Marie Osmond or do you trust God who says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, Of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones you may eat. Okay? So we're going to talk about diet. So here's your discussion questions. Uh, enjoy talking about them. Don't miss the video. We'll see you next class.